Welcome. My name's Amy McDonald. I'm the director of this joint. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking the writer, Ann Patchett. After reading the galleries, galleys of both Matthew Desmond's and Andrew Debuse's, Andre Debuse's books, Anne told Andre, their friends, quote, the two of them should try to connect because their books are fiction, nonfiction sides of the same coin, what it is like to experience poverty in America. Thank you, Anne. I wish I had thought of that. What a brilliant idea. <laughs> Matthew Desmond, he is the Morris P. During Professor of Sociology at Princeton University. He is the author of four books, including <laughs> Evicted, which won the Pulitzer Prize, the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Carnegie Medal, and Ben John Penn John Kenneth Galbraith Award for Nonfiction. He is a recipient of the Genius MacArthur. And he is a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine. He was listed in 2016 among the Politico 50 as one of the 50 people across the country who are most influencing the national political debate. Andre Debus is an award-winning author. His books include the New York Times bestsellers House of Sand and Fog, which was made into a 2003 Oscar-nominated movie starring Ben Kingsley and Jennifer Connelly, The Garden of Last Days, and his memoir, Towney. He has been a finalist for the National Book Award and has been awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship, the National Magazine Award for Fiction, two Pushcart, Pushcart Prizes, and is a recipient of an American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Literature. He teaches full-time at UMass Law. After the conversation, Matt and Andre will be signing copies of their books. Thank you to our wonderful partner, Bookline Booksmith, who will be selling the books in our lobby. If you have questions, we'll be taking them throughout the hour. Go to your phones, type in slido.com and the hashtag poverty, and we will take the questions as they're coming and we feed them to Robin. So we, it's a more organic way of including the audience. Our moderator is our wonderful Robin Young, co-host of NPR and WBUR's Midday Program here and now, and one of our favorite city space moderators. Take it away, Robin. Thanks, Amy. This is what a wonderful, it's finally sunny out and you all came, so thank you. Uh, it's been so dreary. And this is a difficult topic. Uh, so thank you all so much for being here. I'm just curious, I know these are new books. Uh, how many have read either of them? Okay, all right, good, good, good. That's um, cool. Uh, I start with Andre Dubus III, the third and his uh, protagonist, Tom Lowe, who didn't grow up with much. His dad died young. His mom had abusive boyfriends who hit him, his brother, and her. Uh, sometimes they had saltine and butter sandwiches for dinner. But then a kind boyfriend of his mom's gave him the book Siddhartha, searching for who he was meant to be, and Tom does that as well. He becomes a builder. He works with his hands. He marries a woman who is used to abundance. He builds her a beautiful house. What's the town up on the North Shore? Oh. Is it Essex or? I, uh, I didn't imagine her town. Oh, no, I did. Essex. Essex. It's there Essex. You go. <laughs> Essex. We can all pick a beautiful home uh, that, with a view of the water. But he falls off the roof and then he keeps falling. An injury, an addiction, an adjustable mortgage that shoots up, missed payments, a lost house, a lost wife, a divorce. It's like we watch him fall down the stairs and land in a heap at the bottom of Section 8 housing in Western Massachusetts. Then Matthew Desmond's book, Poverty in America. He very briefly writes about how he grew up modestly, the son of a pastor. When a window broke, it stayed broke. Uh, his dad loses his job. The bank takes the family home. No fall from the roof, but a fall from grace. And Matthew becomes a bit of an evangelist himself, trying to answer the question he asked as a kid, how can a country let this happen? His 2016 Pulitzer Prize winning book, Evicted, followed eight struggling families. His new book is about how so many of us are complicit in the struggles of those families, how poverty is bad for the poor, but sometimes good for the rest of us. 
So I welcome again Andre de Vus III and Matthew Desmond. And I know you've each read each other's books, so I just let's just jump in there. Matthew, your thoughts of how Andre uh, painted the picture of poverty. I think one thing that's powerful. Well, first of all, Robin, it's an honor to be here with oh. you. <laughs> The honest hours. You here with I, you I second that. Yeah. yeah. Oh. What he said. That's right. Oh, it's our honor. One thing that Andre, I think, captures really critically is how poverty is much more than the lack of money. And it's often this compiling, exhausting, piling on of problems, including physical pain. And the protagonist of the book is just wrestling with pain day after day, and it comes up over and over again in the book. And I think this is one thing that we often forget about poverty, how it inserts itself into our, our bodies and kind of lives under the skin. I think that's right. Um, there's also like a neighborliness that's part of um, the book. And you know, people are struggling, and that's not romanticized, but people are also supporting each other in ways. And I've lived in some very poor neighborhoods and some affluent neighborhoods, and I've never experienced the kind of neighborliness I've experienced uh, in poor neighborhoods outside of them. So I think that that was part of uh, the novel that really reflected my experience. Right. And Andre, I know you hadn't read uh, Matthew's book while you were writing because it wasn't out yet, but then you did. And yeah. did you see things like I was, when I turned the page and there was the poor selling plasma, you know, yeah. selling their own blood the way Trina does, your, your character, the neighbor of Tom's. Um, what did you think when you read uh, his book? Well, you know, um, when, when I write fiction, when I wrote this novel, I just try to stay into a state of, uh, tr try to stay open and receptive and curious and, and really write from that perspective. Um, so I didn't feel the anger for Tom's straits that I would feel if I weren't trying to capture his life. It's when I read it afterwards that I get angry, that I start to feel all the feelings. But reading his wonderful Poverty by America, I was just so angry because the, the, the central question is essential for, for our time and, and before and beyond. We're in tough straits. The question is, if you're driving by and you see a homeless person, you see abject poverty, the question that we tend to ask as a culture is, well, what kind of bad choices did she make? And his wonderful point in the book is the question should be, who benefits from that kind of poverty? Yeah. And so that I, I found myself um, wonderfully outraged. By wonderfully, I mean, it makes you, makes you want to do more than just write a novel right. about poverty. I want to find out where you got, Tom. But first, mm. let's hear a little bit of each of your books. Okay. Um, there's a page that I wanted you to read because I think, Matthew, it talks about what you were talking about, how Andre has captured this sense of what poverty does. It's not just about, uh, I'm hungry, although it is. And it's not just about, I can't get the health care I need, although it is. It's so much more. <clears throat> poverty is uh, diminished life and personhood. It changes how you think and prevents you from realizing your full potential. It strains the mental energy you can dedicate to decisions, forcing you to focus on the latest stressor and overdue gas bill, a lost job, at the expense of everything else. When someone is shot dead, the children who live on that block perform much worse on cognitive tests in the days following the murder. The violence captures their minds. Time passes and the effect fades until someone else is dropped. Poverty can cause anyone to make decisions that look ill-advised and even downright stupid to those of us unbothered by scarcity. Have you ever sat in a hospital room waiting, watching the clock and praying for good news? You are there locked on the present emergency next to which all other concerns and responsibilities feel and are trivial. That experience is something like living in poverty. Mm. And Andre, that's how I feel with Tom. Mm. It is unbearable because all he can think about is at times are, you know, I have some soreness. I took a bad fall. He has pins in his hips that just, it's unrelenting, the pain. And so he's just focused on that all the time. And, and he, when I say that he, you know, it's not a spiral. Spiral's not the right word. word. This kind of... It's, a, it's falling down the stairs, you know, just one or off a cliff into another cliff into another cliff. He's in pain, can't work, can't work, can't get his car, which has been impounded, can't drive, can't see his son, decides to sell his tools, they get stolen. Yeah. Where'd, you, how, where'd you come to this? 
Well, you know, I, I think the troubles cascade. You know, I, I've got a fancy sounding name, but I grew up in first world poverty with a single mom in mill towns. And I watched uh, this, this woman, my mother, we're either going to pay the rent on time or have heat. We're either going to uh, buy groceries and put gas in the car to go to work, but rent's late again. O on and on and on. And so I, I grew up I'm so, sort of hardwired for scarcity in the way you write about so beautifully in your book, Matt. And so to answer your question, Robin, it, for years I have not lived the way I grew up. For most of my adult life, it's been comfortable and abundant, and, and I pinch myself with gratitude every day. But the question that led to the creation of Tom is, I was a self-employed carpenter for years, and you know, I, the only jobs I ever worked is, if you don't work, you don't get paid today. And so, you know, you, you go to work sick because you got to get paid. And so now I'm, I'm a writer and a teacher and I can call in sick and still get paid. So the question was, what if I, my career as a writer never took off? What if I'm still doing work as a carpenter? What if I took a fall and I couldn't take care of my family? And that's where he came from. He came from some of my deepest fears that have never gone away. Right. Mm. Um, I know you have something uh, to read as well. I could Set read a, I'll, I'll read a, a short, yes, thank you. I have spent many hours contemplating pain. Its constant presence seems like such a dark joke, really. Like the school bully who sits on your chest and spits in your face years after both of you have moved on. My pelvis and hips were fractured years ago. Do they have to keep spitting in my face? It's close to nine and I lie on plywood near the cushions of my couch, over the cushions of my couch in the eight. On the other side of the wall, there's only quiet, no yelling, no barely muffled video games, no fucking. All day and night, I hear through its concrete walls the muffled sounds of bad behavior. Trina yells at her babies. She calls them names. She swears at them. Sometimes her boyfriend Brian will be there, and he yells and swears at them all. Some got their units here in the eight by lottery, others because their family names were on the list for generations. I got mine through my former brother-in-law, Gerard, who was a boy when I married his older sister, a man who is now a lawyer and who, in an act of pity, secured me my own unit here in the eight. My neighbor Fitz drives a new Mustang. It's red with tinted windows, and when the inspectors come to check in on us, he hides it out behind the dumpsters filled with wet diapers and cigarette butts, with old TV sets and eggshells and used condoms, with plastic toys and empty bottles of wine. Mm. Yeah. I wonder too, Andre, if I could stay with you for a second. Um, yes, you grew up in a, a lifestyle that isn't the one you're living now. Um, you're also the son of Andre de Boost II, yeah. who had that, you know, hit by an oncoming car when he stopped on I-93 to assist two motorists losing the use of both legs in a wheelchair. Was some of this from that too? Maybe, uh, it, it's quite possibly, I w if, if so, I wasn't conscious, but I, I did see my dear father live in agony for years, uh, physical pain, and it became clear to me that it, it, you're in a temporary state of insanity. You can't, it, it, it's a good day if you can just get through it and make meals and clean yourself and rest. And so, quite possibly, that was part of my yeah. dream world. Yeah, yeah, the old man. Matthew, just staying with a little of the biography, although I know you, you stay away from it in the book. I don't want to give the impression. It's, it's so brief. It goes by so fast. Like, well, wait a minute. Son of a pastor who lost his house? Um, how much does that influence? As I said, it feels as if in that moment you asked that question and you're still asking it. How can this happen in this country? Tell, tell me more about your dad and, the, and growing up? I grew up in a railroad town called Winslow, Arizona, which is in that Eagle song that you guys are all singing in your heads right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, money was always tight for us. Uh, our gas got shut off regularly, and then when I was in college, uh, the bank took our home before everyone else was doing it. <laughs> and um, I think that that drove a question inside of me a little bit about why this is the way the country deals with problems when families fall on hard times. And then for my last book, I moved into very poor neighborhoods in Milwaukee. I moved into a trailer park, and I moved into a mobile home. 
uh, residence, and then I moved into a rooming house on the north side of Milwaukee. And that's where I saw poverty that I had never seen before and never experienced. I saw grandmas living without heat in the winter. I saw kids routinely evicted. I saw sewage backed up into bathtubs. And that's really where I started pursuing this question about why. You know, why is the richest country in America harbor this hard bottom layer of poverty? Mm. Talk more about that. Um, the richest country in the world, with a gross domestic product larger than the combined economies of Japan, Germany, the UK, India, France, and Italy, has more poverty than they do. Because you say it benefits, it benefits other Americans. So we are weird. Like we are the richest country in the world with the worst poverty. If every poor person in America for, got together and formed a country, that country would have a bigger population than Australia. One in three people in this country live in homes making $55,000 or less. Many are considered officially poor, but what else do you call that, right? And I think that we have to face the fact that there is so much poverty in this country, not in spite of our wealth, but because of it. You know, some lives are made small so that others may grow. And many of us in this room are connected to the problem. It's not just the other party, and it's not just the guy that's a little richer than us. It's many of us. And that means we're also connected to the solution. And talk about you know, some of the reasons that you're seeing for that. I mean, for instance, when people work for really low pay, the things we buy are cheaper. Many of us consume the cheap goods and services the working poor produce. We talk a good game about shareholder capitalism in America, but who are the shareholders? We are often. Half of the country's invested in the stock market. Don't we benefit? when we see our savings go up and up, even if that comes at the cost of a human sacrifice. The welfare state in America is imbalanced. Uh, we give most to families that need it the least in the form of tax breaks. And then we have the audacity to say that we can't afford to cut child poverty or to make sure all of us have access to a doctor. Many of us benefit from that lopsided Welfare state. Explain more. I mean, some of us have government subsidized employer health care plans or, um, you know, we get tax breaks for, for certain things. Talk, talk more about the invisible welfare that we don't see. Mm -hmm. Until someone tries to reform it and then we really see it, right? <laughs> um, so maybe it's not so invisible. We just don't like talking about it. So uh, if you own a home, you are eligible for one of the sweetest cutouts in the tax code. It's called the mortgage interest deduction. You could take it on your first and second home, including your yacht or your RV or, you know. And, um, and that costs the country about $193 billion a year. Uh, that's more than triple the direct uh, amount we spend on direct housing assistance to the needy. And so, um, and most of that benefit accrues to the top 20% of Americans. So a mortgage suburban home in Lincoln and a 15-story public housing project in Dorchester are both government subsidized, just one looks and feels that way. Yeah, and the, the, the housing project. And it's, in, it's so interesting, Andre. Again, you didn't plan it this way, but so many of the things that uh, Tom encounters are outlined in, in Matthew's book. There's yeah. the flexible, fle flexible mortgage, mm -hmm. you know, greedy uh, banker, the exorbitant fees. Talk about the fees, mm -hmm. you know, to get his car. Oh. Well, I, when I did research on if your car gets towed, uh, it, it, it's incredible how much you can. It's, it's so my 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 main character is just so mind addled in pain. So he drives without a license. He drives his um, his next door neighbor, who's half his age, Trina, to sell her plasma for rent because her former boyfriends, who are the fathers of her children, don't pay child support. She's doing it all alone, the way millions of women do. Uh, so he drives her, forgets his license. That's $500 driving without a license. Um, he's driving with uh, expired registration because he's too ill to take care of it. Didn't have the money to fork over the 40, 50, 80 bucks. That's another $637. And, and, then, the, and then the fines for towing the car and then keeping the car. So, you know, while reading this, it, I wasn't reading Matthew's wonderful book, but I, I, I was reading some stats about poverty and, and one that really, actually, I may have heard on National Public Radio. The fact that almost 80% of American families have less, have $400 or less in the bank in case of an emergency, 400 bucks, 400 bucks, that's, that's, that won't even pay all your bills for a week. Almost 80% of us. And 
you know, Matt, one of the, the many things I love about your book is it, you're very clear on, on where, where the imbalances are. We just have to tax the rich. The rich just have to pay their fair share, as do corporations. Poverty goes away. It's, that's well, essential. if, you know, Matthew, talk about that, the, the number, the, I think it's $177 billion or something you came up with if, if people just paid their taxes. But then take up how the next step is the welfare money has to get to the people who need it, which it doesn't always. But take that up. Right. So uh, I want to end poverty in America. I want to end it. And so one place to start uh, with that ambition is just to ask, well, how much would that cost? Say that again. You don't want to just make things better. You want to end. No, I think we should embrace the moral charge of becoming poverty abolitionists. And if we're poverty abolitionists, then we look at poverty not as something we have to live with or something we should want to reduce, but something we should want to eradicate. Oh, we have an audience question. Is poverty eradicatable? If so, what would be necessary to eliminate it and what would a post-poverty world look like? So continue, talk about the taxes first. During COVID, we cut child poverty by 46% in six months with a one simple program, it was called the Child Tax Credit, which is basically guaranteed basic income for moderate and low-income families with kids. 46% reduction in child poverty in six months. We could do this. It would cost an estimated $177 billion to lift everyone below the official poverty line above it. It's a rough estimate, but it's a good place to start when we're talking about what we're talking about, when we're talking about ending poverty, because what we're talking about is something that's completely within our grasp. Like, this is less than 1% of our GDP. A study a few years ago showed that if the top 1% of Americans just paid the taxes they owed, not got taxed more, just paid what they owed, that we as a nation could raise $175 billion a year. So we could just about fill the poverty gap uh, if we had tax fairness. So I think this is a goal that's absolutely attainable. We'll give one example uh, of why we know they're not. Facebook in Ireland. Okay, so there's a lot of shenanigans going on. And one, <laughs> one of the shenanigans is that corporations are registering their places of business in countries that have far lower tax rates, like Ireland or uh, uh, the Cayman Islands, for example, or other places. And everyone knows this is happening, but we do not have the people power in Washington to police this and collect us. Now, I also want to just say, this isn't just about the super mega corporations and just about the top richest Americans. This is about how a lot of us talk about our taxes. Like we just had tax season. And I'll bet a lot of us lean over the fence and we're just like, uh, taxes. And everyone does this. This is how we talk. How can I, how can I pay less? Yeah, how can I pay less? Yeah. What if we started talking about taxes differently? And what if we started talking about all these benefits that we often don't see because we're looking at what we have to pay and not what we don't have to. Yeah. Amen. Uh, I, the, just to finish the Ireland, have I got this right? I don't, have the, I don't think I have the number right, but Facebook claimed to have made something like a hundred and da 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 billion-y million -y things <laughs> in Ireland, which you figured out would have been like 10 million from every resident of Ireland. Every, every employee. <laughs> every employee. They were like super productive employees <laughs> yeah. in Ireland. Yeah. <laughs> so in other words, they were hiding profits there. Yep. Yeah. Um, Andre, as you, you know, are, are writing, the first phase that Tom Wolf goes through is, is resentment. He's so angry. Yeah. Um, which is also, a, you know, something that is, is holding him up. Um, you're an author, so you don't have to have lived these things. But where did you, you know, where did you come to that rage and that anger and, you know, that, um, you know, we've talked about the almost the inability to function, the Trina yelling at her children. Yeah. Have you heard that? Did you? Well, no. I, I grew up in poor neighborhoods, and, and it's not to suggest that wealthy neighborhoods don't have bad behavior in them. <laughs> people yeah. are people, but. Um, no, I, I, I grew up in neighborhoods where people were stressed, and when you're stressed, you misbehave. You know, you're, things are hard. 
You know, the thing that I think I identify most with this main character is he, he, he makes up a word, abundist. He calls his ex-wife an abundist. And he, you know, he grew up in scarcity. And, and that, that came directly from, from my existence. And again, you know, Matt talks about this in his book. But you know, even though I have not uh, lived in scarcity for many years, I still am hardwired for it. And, um, and I think Tom is too. So when he, as Robin says, in the beginning of this novel, he is stewing in anger and resentment. And he's got good reason. He's stewing at, at the banker who talked him into an adjustable rate mortgage. He knew he had no business signing. He had a good year. He signed it anyway. This is really the, the, the crux of the subprime loans, talking people into who should, should not be taking that risk. I want to talk more about our values as a culture in a minute, too. Uh, he's stewing at the insurance company. He paid. He had self. I also had self-employed insurance as a as a carpenter, and you miss one payment and you fall, and it, it doesn't matter anymore. And he so he's get, stewing he it down. Coverage. And he's stewing at the pharmaceutical companies, who knowingly we know this now, especially with the Sackler family, who are selling drugs they know are highly addictive and kill millions, and they don't care because they're making billions. So I right now I'm I'm feeling the anger that he had. Uh, however, that anger and resentment combined with this physical pain and not seeing his 20-year-old son is, is crippling him even further. So what I love about writing, and Robin, you know I've talked about this, I, 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 love, I love when the writing takes you someplace you don't see coming. And he does begin to go someplace I can, I can only consider spiritual uh, in the book that surprised me. Well, you know, I have to say, when you said you're, you're still hardwired, Yeah. You know, I had forgotten as I was reading along, I, I got so kind of enmeshed with your characters and like, oh, don't do that. Or, you know, um, I forgot uh, because we think of the house, the beautiful house that he built and he lost up yeah. in Essex. And that's to me money yeah. and this beautiful, abundant wife. And she married, uh, you know, a, a, a very wealthy man after she left him. And I'm, so I forgot what he hasn't forgotten, which is that he never thought that he deserved it in the first place. Yeah. This idea that he always felt like an imposter and then yeah. sure enough here he is thrown back in uh you know public housing you talk a little bit about that well and, and his 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 ex-wife is a psychologist and she accuses him of projection and sabotaging their success and he's just dumbfounded by this thought well how can i there's a great line from florence and the machine i didn't build it to wreck it and i played that song a lot while writing this you know, nobody builds their lives to wreck it but we do live in a culture that helps you wreck it. You know, I, I have to ask a question because this man's a sociologist, and I actually, that's my undergraduate degree is in sociology. Hmm. You know the book. And you're uh, employed, gainfully employed. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I switched career. <laughs> the, the Pursuit of Loneliness by Philip Slater. Yeah. You remember this book? So it's yeah. big. He, he can probably talk about it more authority, but. I, I did think about this. this. This book would come to me while writing this novel. Basically, Slater argues in this book, pursuit of happiness, my ass. It's the pursuit of loneliness. Because we're a culture that still divides its citizens into their winners or losers. You're either a winner or a loser. And what's a winner? Someone wealthy. Everyone else is a loser. I'm wondering if that is what... I mean, I, when you talk about the abolition of poverty, I, 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 I think we're up against a psychic wall there. I think Americans still like that poor people exist because, well, I'm not that bad. I'm more of a winner. I wonder what you would say about that. It got me thinking about our sort of cultural value. I think we've become too easily pleased. Yeah. And I do think many of us are pining for a different country, a safer, freer Fair country, wouldn't it be nice not to worry uh, about your kids so much? You know, to know that you're not one divorce or one car accident or one roof accident away from destitution. Wouldn't it be nice to walk down the street at two in the morning and not worry about crime so much? Uh, wouldn't it be nice to put our values, you know, in the law, actually? Educate a kid without spending $250,000 on a bachelor's degree. Yeah. 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 Vocational training, all that. But so the part one that you say is, you know, and it seems, it does seem, and I think we've tried to do this, you know, tax, tax both the wealthy and corporations, have them pay at least their fair share. Uh, but then you go on to explain, and this was, I mean, I, I know this because I've reported on it, but it was still 
it's shocking to see it laid out, how little of the aid to poor people actually gets to them. Is it 22 cents on the dollar? And we read about this, we knew about the scandal in Mississippi where it turned out that it was going to, you know, a famous wrestler and, uh, you know, just all the welfare department money was going to these... Million dollar man. Yeah, the million dollar man and others. <laughs> but, you know, in other states, Oklahoma uses part of their federal... Um, aid money to hire a Christian, no, to, to pay for programs that promote marriage. Right. T talk, talk more about what you found about where this money actually goes. So some anti-poverty programs are incredibly efficient and most of the money reaches the family, uh, but others aren't. And uh, some parts of the welfare state are a leaky bucket. And this is a program called Temporary Assistance to Needy Families or TANF. This is cash welfare as we know it. And when Bill Clinton reformed cash welfare in the mid-90s, he turned it into a block grant, which is just a policy wonky way of saying, OK, states, here's a chunk of money. You've got some discretion about how you use it. And states really use that discretion. And this isn't just a red state issue. You know, A lot of states use the money to um, fund anti-abortion clinics or Christian summer camps. Some states don't even give out the money at all, like Hawaii, our bluest state is sitting on so much unused welfare money that they could give every poor kid in the state $10,000. And so this is wow. one example of how a dollar in the budget doesn't mean a dollar in, in a family's hand. And what we're talking about when we're talking about this is we're talking about like kids not getting enough to eat. We're talking about kids getting evicted. That's, that's what we're talking about when we're not talking about getting money to those families. When you mentioned Bill Clinton, there's an excori well, there's a lot of excoriating pages, but one of them just, just nails through what politicians have said about the poor. Mm -hmm. And Bill Clinton, you know, we're gonna get people off welfare to work as if they wouldn't if they could, you know. And Reagan, I can tell you about public housing that has crystal chandeliers and swimming pools. And you just go through how the poor have been demonized, when in fact, you know, you bust so many of those myths. And Andre, you do in some of your characters. Tina, mm -hmm. who's barely keeping it together as someone who was, you know, pregnant as a child practically, mm -hmm. and so is her mother, and so will her daughter probably be. Mm -hmm. When Tom gets in her apartment, it's neat as a pen. Yep. Um, Tom is trying not to drink. Matthew, talk about some of those myths that we have about the poor that aren't true. Include, you, you were living with... Um, in, a, in an impoverished neighborhood, and you, you stop by the liquor store to get something, and four women in the car were like, oh, we don't drink. Yeah. One thing that was shocking to me when I was living in super poor neighborhoods in Milwaukee is how many people endured their poverty like dead sober, you know? And um, I was like, I would like a drink, you know? Like, this is hard on me, you know? And, uh, yeah. and I think that... Um, this is an old story, like the forced countenance of the poor is something an economist talked about 100 years ago because, you know, you can't afford it. And, um, but there's this constant demonization of the poor, right? How are you spending your food stamps? You know, how are you spending that check? No one's asking me how I'm spending my mortgage interest deduction. And so I think there's this moral unequivalence that's, that's going on here. One of the things we hear about a lot is about welfare dependency. We heard about it nonstop during COVID. But if you look in the data, you realize a much bigger problem is welfare avoidance. That there's all these programs for low-income families that they don't, they don't take, take advantage, advantage of. Yeah, yeah. They, they don't know and how it's, it's complicated. Um, and something about, there's something about stigma here. And if any of y'all have spent a day in the welfare office, like it's an incredibly dehumanizing experience. But the more data suggests this list, we've made these incredibly hard. In some states, you have to get fingerprinted and photographed to get on welfare. In California, you have to answer over 200 questions to apply for food stamps. Mm -hmm. And so this is enraging because if our country knows how to do something right, it's to market things to people and get things to people. Yeah, so why can't we do that? Why can't we do that with things that matter most? First of all, I have to say, your dad would be so proud because there's a lot of mm-hmms in here. I mean, it's like we are at church on Sunday. <laughs> listening to you, but someone asks, how do you dispel the myth of the so-called welfare queen? Well, you don't look at them as the other. You know, one of the things, writing this novel, this character, there but for the grace of God go every single one of us. Well, 
we're just one injury away, mm-hmm. one layoff away, one injury and layoff away, one addicted child or spouse away, one elderly parent who needs to live with us away from being on the street. And so for me, I, I, I find that, that projection of uh, us against them to be absolutely artificial. And, and, you know, and this is in, in Matt's book as, as well. I mean, you didn't, I don't think you said it directly, but correct me if, if you did, Matt. Um, we ignore the poor at our own peril. We are all enmeshed in the same world. And um, if it's not just the, the, the right thing to do, it, it's also, I think it serves a self-interest. Towards the end of the book, you talk about the absence of poverty actually frees us, actually leads to more freedom. Yeah. I, you know, I take a lot of wisdom from um, novelists and, and writers, and I really loved this book and connected so much with it. And another book that was a guiding light for me when writing Poverty by America was uh, There, There by Tommy Orange. And there's a, mm. there's a line in There, There where he says, these kids are jumping out of the windows of burning buildings, falling to their deaths, and we think that the problem is that they're jumping. <laughs> And that's the American poverty debate. So we need to find ways of focusing on the fire, like who lit it, who's warming their hands by it. Because the poverty debate cannot just be like, nah, uh actually, you know, and a lot of us who are trying to defend the poor often are on our back heels from the jump because someone else is controlling the questions. We have to start controlling the questions. So there is a culture of poverty in America. But it's our culture. It's a culture of opportunity hoarding and exploitation and an unbalanced welfare state. And I think that we have to start talking about those issues, which kind of expands the aperture beyond these old, tired questions. I want to hear more about that, because you do in the epilogue make suggestions, and they're they're simple and pointed, beyond taxing the wealthy and and that. But uh, you know, when you say it's our culture, I'm sure I'm not the only one. For many of us, it's our story. I mean, we've heard your stories. I had a grandfather who was a, a designer for Arrow Shirts, you know, in upstate New York, and became a Bowery bum and was delivered to our door. Hmm. This was in the 50s, you know, before there was any kind of safety net, it was such as it is now. And it, you know, tore my father's life apart because he had been abandoned by this same father. And I have a relative who uh, wrestles with mental illness. And what I love, Andre, about the book is that you show through Tom's ex-wife, it can be so difficult. Uh, you know, it's, it, people might say, oh, it's difficult to see the poor on the streets. It's very difficult to love them, <laughs> you know, because you can't help it. You want them to, can, come on. Stand up, be the person I know you can be, Tom. And, um, or listen, you've got this Section 8 housing. You can't invite every homeless person that you know into your apartment because you're going to lose your housing. You know, right. um, It's often really difficult. It's difficult on a societal level because maybe, it's, you know, as you point out, as you're afraid of something, you see, Tom certainly sees that. He feels people looking at him with his old coat and no socks. And oh, he's, he's ashamed. He's so ashamed. He's ashamed every day. Yeah. And yet people, I can see people on the other side of that look, thinking, I don't know what I'm, I don't know what this, I don't know what I'm dealing with because the, the twain don't meet. And it's very difficult when you love someone and you can't pull them you know, what, what do they say? Put on your own, you know, uh, jacket before you jump in after a drowning person because you're going to drown. Mm-hmm. And uh, you do have some of that in the, in the book, the, mm-hmm. the new husband and the ex-wife who, who try. Mm-hmm. Just, I just wondered if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, I think we have to try. You know, I, I do think that this culture has made us cruel and self-involved. And, um, you know, I have a Canadian sister-in-law, my wife's older sister, who whenever she visits, she just about loses her shit (laughs) when she hears how much it costs to send our three kids to college. And when she hears how much it costs for one of my relatives who didn't have health insurance, that he got a bill for $372,000, which he'll never pay. We live in a cruel culture, and we can talk about you know, capitalism and being competitive. But this is, I would argue, this is not 
capitalism, it's a corporatocracy, corporatocracy. and now I'm, I'm quoting from a wonderful new book by Finn Murphy called Rocky Mountain High about his dive into the cannabis business. Um, we have to try, and I, I think we, we have to face the fact that how we were raised encourages us to look at each other as competitors, not as family, not as brothers and sisters. I think it leads to racism, misogyny, homophobia, and war. We've got to change our culture. Matthew, this is your suggestion. Win, win with hate. Win with, win with love. <laughs> oh, my God. So you're so American. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I mean, you, 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 it, it sounds so, um, it's someone say a preacher's son. But you do mean that. Win, fight poverty with love. Um, so I think that in the poverty debate, there's this old tired phrase. It's like, well, we know what we need to do. We have the money. We just need to build political will. But like, that's kind of on us then. Like, it's on us. And that means we need to start taking steps to doing that. And we can start doing that today. Um, and we can take little steps from shopping more ethically with respect to our economic justice values. We do that often with environmental values, but we don't inquire what uh, the farmhand got paid by picking our local organic cucumber. And immigrants right. don't cause poverty, you know, or don't cause you know, uh, states to collapse. Immigrants actually make states robust where they are. Sure. So uh, if you just look at the immigration line over the last 50 years, it's really gone up. You know, we used to be a country that had, I think, one in 20 folks were foreign born. Now it's about one in eight foreign born folks in the United States. And poverty has not gone up like that. It's kind of stayed the same, depending on what measure we look at. Three states hold about half of all immigrants in the country, California, Florida, and Texas. Uh, over the last 50 years, any uh, Poverty rate in California has basically stayed the same. It's actually decreased by a few points in Texas and Florida. So just by like simple metrics, like the math just doesn't, just doesn't work out with that story. Well, I mean, these, you give so many of these myth-busting examples, but you were saying, you know, where do we go? And you mentioned, and I think we went, went by it, this notion that so many people in poverty don't even know how to take advantage, or they just don't take advantage of the aid that's there for them, or it's too complicated. But I would, I would argue, too, that they're too ashamed to reach out. You know, and, uh, you know, my own mother, uh, we, we were eligible for Section 8 housing, food stamps, and whatever program. She didn't take advantage of any of them uh, because she didn't identify, she, you know, she read this book. She said, you know, one of my great sadnesses is I, I didn't hide our poverty from you, kids. I thought I hid it. Mm. <laughs> well, mom, you can't hide much. Mm. Mm. <laughs> One pair of pants for the winter, there you go, ma. <laughs> and you know, we're better off than millions of people around the world, thinking also about third world poverty, which is the worst, of course. Um, I don't know. I, I think it comes, it comes down to values. I think that people are inherently loving human beings around the world. I think this, this culture, and I love America, I love the First Amendment, I love all the potential of this land, but I do think it, it, it makes us cruel and self-involved. Well, going back to you know, some of the changes that can be made, there is the shame, destigmatize it, but you also say, make it possible. So we have all these tech companies in the world. Why can't government forms be easy to fill out? Mm. Um, they were really easy during COVID. So the mm. child tax credit got passed in March, checks went out in June. You know, so one of the lessons we learned during the pandemic was get rid of all this administrative burden, figure out a way of connecting people to these programs in really seamless ways. We did that during the pandemic and it really made a difference. And so you're right, stigma is part of the story, but like if you look at food stamp rates, like in Oregon, basically everyone who could qualify for food stamps receives them, and in California, only 63% do. It's like massively varies across states. So why? Well, Oregon just does a way better job connecting families mm -hmm. to these programs. And we can, this is, like the, this is like the least we can do, right? This is the lowest hanging fruit. And so studies show that like half of all elderly Americans that qualify for food stamps do not receive them. 
And so, but studies show that if you send folks a postcard, it's like, call this number, you might be eligible. And if folks call it and a real human being picks up the phone and spends like 20 minutes with a person, it's a bunch of take-up rates go up. But, but it isn't the reaching out itself destigmatizing. Hey, yeah, look what we got, yeah. come on in. We got a lot of people signing up, as yeah. opposed to when you don't hear about it. I think the subterranean message is, well, you, you should not hear about it because it's a dirty secret and you should be ashamed of yourself. Right. Yeah. But if we're, we're all passing it out, it's destigmatizing. Business people I know during COVID were thrilled to get, they couldn't you know, call yeah. fast enough to get their government help. Um, yeah. You also say that the thing we can and must do is be allies. Talk about that. So what, so what does it mean to be a poverty abolitionist? Um, I think it means subscribing to the conviction that poverty is an abomination. And like other abolitionist movements against slavery, against the prison, recognizing that profiting from someone else's pain corrupts us all. So a poverty abolitionist tries to divest from poverty in their everyday life. So here's like five concrete things we can do. You can shop differently and invest differently. Uh, many of us know what kind of shoes or coffee to drink to signal like we're this kind of progressive person. <laughs> but like we often don't know how much money folks are making in shops we frequent. And so we can do like buy more union made products. Um, we can talk about our taxes differently. Like the next time tax season rolls around and your neighbor or your coworker is like, dude, taxes, maybe we should be like, dude, I know, I get this crazy tax break just from owning a home. <laughs> and I wouldn't lose a lot of sleep over it, except like we have more than a million public school kids today that are homeless. And so I've donated my savings to my like local anti-eviction group and I've written my congressperson saying you should wind this down for me. Like that'd be an awkward conversation, but that's how we change the common culture in this country. Three, all of us have influence somewhere, like somewhere in some sphere, on a school board, or like I'm a professor. I should start asking like, what is my university's endowment invested in? Like, what are, we, are we taking care of our landscapers? Are we treating our adjunct faculty fairly? I think these are like, you can flex your influence where you are. Fourth, many of us, and this is especially true of the white folks in the room, continue to be segregationist. And we surround ourselves with walls and we hoard opportunity behind those walls. We need to tear down the walls. And this isn't just abstract. This means like we have to haul our butts to zoning board meetings on Tuesday night and stand up and be like, look, I refuse to deny kids opportunities my kids get living here. Build this. And the fifth, we could join an anti-poverty movement. And if you're interested in doing that, I have a website for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's called In Poverty USA in the Poverty USA, and it has anti-poverty groups at the national level in Massachusetts and all around the country putting in the good work. We can plug in. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask each of you uh, about reaction to your books, you to your previous book, Evicted. Um, yeah, I know you've done book signings for that with people who've already read them and come up to you, or book signings maybe for other books or other things, and people have come up to you. What, what have you heard? Because books, I guess what I'm saying to both of you, I'm about to say to both of you, is you could write a book, you know? If we could write like you, both of you, uh, books have impact. What, what has yours been? So um, I've been able to trace like the policy impact of Evicted over the years. And I can, I can give receipts about that. And, um, but what's been really special about uh, being on the road on, for this book is there's a lot of people that are coming up to me and they're like, you know, I read Evicted and now I'm a, I'm a tenant's attorney, you know? Or I read Evicted and now I work in public housing. And like seeing the book's impact on that really intimate level has been incredibly moving to me, yeah. yeah. And I'm thinking of you, Andre. First of all, congratulations. I mean, that's, that's gotta be. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's gotta be. Um, Validating. And Andre, do you read reviews? No. Oh, really? <laughs> never. Well. No. Well. <laughs> no, never. Can't do it. Kills me. Well, my Look, if they're bad, they hurt my feelings for 100 years. If they're good, I don't believe them anyway. So, <laughs> because, why do it? Because of the aforementioned, you still see yourself as that kid, you know. I think and, so. Yeah. I, I just put right. my head down and, and work. 
<laughs> which is Tom's personality, too. Mm. Well, I would recommend the New York Times uh, <laughs> review by Isaac Fitzgerald. My wife told me it was good. Yeah. <laughs> Isaac Fitzgerald, oh my God, Dirtbag, Massachusetts. Love that book. Love that book. This is um, Isaac Fitzgerald. You might have seen him. You know, he made his way to the Today Show, and he was doing kind of their book club or something. And then he revealed in it, this is a confessional um, memoir in which he told the story of how he grew up with some, you know, parents who tried, but uh, there's some wackiness there. But um, you know, they ended up homeless. And he was homeless for quite a while and then lived in poverty. And uh, an incredible book, really incredible book. And um, always had that feeling of imposter syndrome. Right? You know, mm -hmm. I'm on the Today Show, but I'm still living in that car right. in downtown Boston. Yeah. And he writes, oh, let's just say that at the end of the book, <laughs> a little bit of a spoiler alert here, Tom comes to a place that you can describe it if you'd like, but it, it feels uh, almost, you know, holy, <laughs> sort of an acceptance of where he is. And um, Isaac Fitzgerald writes that he cried. It made him cry. Because it was the first time he really, he'd written a whole book about it, but he really understood, I have to forgive myself. Hmm. Hmm. I have to forgive myself. Hmm. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, my, um, my younger brother and I, my dad died suddenly of a heart attack, and we were carpenters, so we, we built his coffin, and we dug his grave with pick and shovel. And we stayed up all night building this coffin, and, and the morning after, I with sawdust on me, I, I, I just went into our little half house we lived in, my wife and three little kids, and, and I just grabbed, I grabbed a novel off the shelf just to get my mind off death and grief and it's a Graham Greene novel, The End of the Affair. It's a beautiful book if you haven't mm. read it. And the epigraph of the novel is this. Man has places in his heart which do not yet exist and into them enters suffering in order that they may have existence. Uh, French writer Leon Bloy. Yeah, I, I share that with you all because you asked, you know, what are some of the reactions? Well, I don't read the reviews, but I've been, I love that book signing line. I love that. It's my favorite part, meeting people and signing books and saying hello. And a few people have said, I couldn't keep reading. I just found him so depressing. <laughs> and I find that reaction depressing because I think it's part of the problem. And I don't judge any person. They can live their lives. But I think we have a horrible, uh, what's the word, impatience for people in trouble. We have a huge impatience for people who make bad choices. It's I, I, don't, I don't know if I've ever made a choice in my life. I mean, I, I, what, what's a bad choice? Okay, maybe the fourth bourbon in 10 minutes was not good, but maybe I should, I, mean, I don't know. I, I, I find that, look, I'm glad to hear a nice reaction, but I, I hear a lot of uh, impatience with a man who's at the bottom. And I guess that's my point. And I try not to make a point with a novel, but excuse me. All it takes is for this, this to happen, and you, my friend, are on the bottom. And let's hope somebody is not impatient with you. Well, not only that, uh, someone said to me um, something along that line, like, oh, but the screws in his hips. Now, I just had a terrible fall. I broke my shoulder. Oh, sorry. And, yeah, but after, like you, I'm like, thank God I work with my mouth, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, you know. Right. I can still work. And, and this person was like, oh, but the pain. I said, oh, but that's the point. He's living with it. How do you think he feels? Yeah. How do you think he feels? Right. And that's what you let us know. But, and, and okay, and so that's the job, I think, of the novelist to write with empathy and compassion. But that's also the beautiful message of, of your book, Poverty by America. It's all fueled by, excuse me, these are our brothers and sisters, man. Yeah. Andre Dubus III, Matthew Desmond. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Head out to the lobby. They are personalizing copies of their books. It's going to be a long line. We're going to move it along as best we can. But thank you all for coming. Thank you, thank you Andre, Matt, and Robin. Wonderful conversation.